Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about getting the engine roughly in position and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Because of the storm, it ended up being a pretty short week. Once the storm was over, the weather actually still wasn't great for the bulk of the week. So most of what you see in this video actually just happens on the Friday when we finally got a little bit of blue sky again. All right, pretty average weather still, but not windy at least. So my plan is to lift the back of the engine up, take this whole mount out, probably take the polyflex mount and the plate out, and that'll give me room to get in and weld those gussets in. So let's lift it up first, go from there. Go. Interestingly, after this storm, there's a whole lot of really nasty, sooty black gunk in my bilge, and as far as I can tell, it's come from the air intakes, which are well up high above the wheelhouse. All right, now what we need to do is the plate's going to come up pretty much against here, so. I need to put one about here, one about here, it doesn't need to be exact. Weld those in, then we can put the foot back on, lay it down, at least it'll be flat. But what I'm also gonna do is move the whole engine forward before I lay it down. It's rigged up to welding those gussets, but it's just started raining again. Pedley's got one of those gazebo things in his backyard, portable. I'm very tempted to grab that steal it and put it on the boat he won't miss it yeah there's no way they're going to untangle themselves while the current's running so i uh, just spoke to a mate dave works for maritime still he's going to come down and uh try and tow the front one forward and just get them unlocked from each other uh the chaos continues in gear driving it's about the exact same speed as the current not idle either, that's idle. That's driving going nowhere. Anyway, we're off. Trying to go through all the Detroit bolts and find the bolts for the coupler. Of course, D Squad thinks that I'm sorting through some sort of food, but it's not. Sorry. I don't know what I've done with them. I'm gonna have to get some new ones. Typical. Actually, I think I found them. We're in luck which is good, because they were really specific length. They had to go through, but not have the nuts stick out of the flange, etc. So that's good. We're in business. The box of Detroitus has yielded a result. I also found this, which I believe is the gasket to put the Jabsco pump onto the block. So we'll do that today too. Before we get started on the engine again, there's one little job I've been meaning to finish for ages, which is a friend's outboard. It's a little mariner or something, having lots of troubles. Did a carb clean, did it again, ended up replacing all the fuel lines because they were perishing, new fuel, all that kind of stuff. But the thing I want to show you is these inline filters are actually quite like glass casing. You can clean them, you can replace the filters, whatever. But what I like about them is they come with little uh, adapters, barbs, for different fuel sizes. In this case, it's a 3 8 which is what the fuel tank and the bulb and everything is. But the engine itself, is I think it's called quarter inch six mil kind of um, uh, fuel barb there and because you install the tails yourself the barbs yourself I can put a three eighths in this end and a quarter inch in this end so they're actually as well as being filters they're a really great way to adapt from one fuel size to another anyway just a little tip I'll get on and finish this and then we'll get on with the engine so just cut a length of this uh, six mil hose and we should be in business. Oh, and for ages I've been meaning to mention that uh, a mate of mine, Justin, runs cruises called the Riverboat Postman because they deliver our mail to the islands and up and down the river. So if ever you wanted to see the part of the river where Renko's moored, uh, you can just jump on and do a bit of a day cruise. I think they do snacks and that kind of stuff as well. So I'll put a link to them in the description. 
Ah, uh, one more tip before we uh, get on with the Detroit. Little engines like this can have no power. And you know, you've, you've, you're cleaning the carb, you're doing plugs, you're doing absolutely everything you think of. And an odd thing that can cause it is resistance. On an outboard, the drive shaft turns all the time and it's actually the gearbox that selects forward and reverse. So Sometimes they run lower, it depends, but there can be bushings in the leg of the drive shaft. And if they're corroded and gummed up, like I've already wiped that with acetone, and you can see there's this sort of stuff still on it. And this can be enough friction to actually make the motor stall in idle. You know, you give it heaps of revs, it goes, you let it drop to idle, it stalls. And it can simply be the corrosion, old grease, all that kind of stuff building up and binding up the drive shaft. So just something else to consider if you think you've nailed the engine and it's still stalling at idle, pull the gearbox off and just have a look at the drive shaft. See if you can see like old grease like this or an area where maybe it's even wearing because the pressure as the, you know, the corrosion grows, it swells and it's really pinching on the drive shaft. So you should see some witness marks too. Anyway, just something else to consider in your diagnosis. All right, that outboard's gone now, which is great. Makes a bit more space. I don't think people realise, particularly with a GoPro, because it's a bit fisheye, how small Renko really is as a boat. It's not a big boat at all. I mean, for example, <laughs> that's me touching both sides of the wheelhouse. So when people talk about the wheel being at one side and the sat nav being another, you've got to kind of consider that <laughs> it's pretty much next to you still. Also, while I think about it, one guy in particular got very cranky about it being high uh, because the cables come down and there's a few things worth mentioning. Yes, currently two cables come down, but eventually three cables are going to go up. So, you know, you're actually better off having it high from a cable point of view. The other thing is, we've got a bit of a gap here. I can easily see the horizon standing, let alone sitting. But uh, I'm actually going to look at cutting this and then TIG welding it back together. Obviously, it needs to be really well aligned, so I'm going to have to make a jig so that when I weld it back together, it's in a good position. But with a slight angle on it too, I can easily lift that a couple of inches, which will give me even more room, and I think it'll look nicer too. So definitely plans for tweaking that. Another really weird thing we do in Australia with boats is we try something, and if it doesn't work, we change it. All right, time to man up and finally tackle this alignment. At least start it, you know. I think once I start, it'll flow from there. Gonna grind an area under, so I'll grind a little tab, tab, then I've gotta go under and down. So here are the gussets I'm gonna weld in. Put one about here, doesn't matter exactly because the plate floats on top of them, but what about here? What about here? Happy days. an absolute nightmare and they're not particularly straight but the gussets are in I think there's enough weld on them particularly given that they're under compression you know they're pushing into here and this top plate's gonna be welded right out as well so I think they'll do the trick what I just did as well is centered the bolts in the slots on the polyflex mounts so that I've got you know equal movement in both directions the plan now is to do the same with all of these. So you can see how here on this slot, it's further along. So I'm gonna lift them up, center them, then I'm gonna drop them. Then I have to move the engine forward. So I'm gonna go around the other side, given that I've only got the back of the engine lifted at the moment. So I'll go around the other side, center these mounts, then I'll lower the back, do the same with the front. All right, the forward side was coming off the rails because the boat currently lists a little bit to starboard. Don't know why. I've got a handful of scuba cylinders, but not a lot of weight on the starboard side. Also, all the steel uh, wet exhaust used to come down the port side, so maybe the boat was ballasted in some ways to have that there. Haven't seen anything though, so I think all I can do really is wait until everything's in, in situ and everything's done, everything's offloaded and then um, ballast it to be level. Anyway, 
this is proving tricky. I'm supporting a bit of weight here, lifting here. I can use the pry bar, the crowbar here, to push the engine forward a little bit, but then it just slides back. So I need to get in there and put some clamps on the rail or something. I've got a big ratchet strap here that I could put around the engine and try and pull it forward. But there's currently nothing I can actually attach the ratchet strap to. So I may have to rig something up. So I've been wrestling with it for, I don't know, an hour or so now. I say wrestling, mostly swearing, some wrestling. And I think we're kind of getting close. Let's have a look. So I can straighten that. That's not the end of the earth. I can probably just hammer that into place. These ones, I put some clamps here just to stop it sliding forward. And I can now fit this block of wood between the flanges. You know, we're a billion miles out in our alignment. But basically all that wrestling was about opening a gap up. Running out of steam, unfortunately. I know I haven't got much achieved this week, even though it's been a busy week. Do have Leon coming on Sunday to help me with some electrics, which is great. Thank you, Leon, as always. Leon, you saw in previous videos who, you know, just a mate who um, is good with electrical stuff. So it's nice to have second pair of hands, second brain and some moral support. Now, what I might do here, I actually have a little face spanner that I'm hoping, yep, fits in these holes. As I think I mentioned in a previous video, I forgot to tighten this up. I think that little notch there and that notch there, when they line up, a locking screw goes in. Then I'm actually thinking I'm going to put the polyflex I've got onto here, if I can, to be honest with you, I don't think I can as it is now. So what I'm thinking I might do is get these shims better position than they are now, but you know, they're getting close at least then tack them in place. Then I can undo these two nuts and lift the engine off the shims, which will mean I can get to the bolts on the end here, put the polyflex mount on. Then I can do a sort of a medium alignment, get as close as I can. Mm. Now, other suggestions I've had, Andrew Tinnick, a mate of mine suggested, you know, he often actually just gets like a socket or something that's that distance and you can run it around. You can feel where it catches, use it like a feeler gauge, you know. Feeler gauges are all about just feeling resistance. Doesn't matter if they're two inches thick or five thousandths thick. They still kind of, you know, tell you where there's resistance and where there isn't. So I kind of like that idea too. Uh, that too was a wrestle. But now the, I'm not sure if you can see from this angle, but the little half moon in the shaft and the half moon in the nut line up. All right, so I can get a screw in here now and lock the nut onto the shaft. Of course, in all that turning, the shaft never turned even slightly. One silver lining, I guess, would be harder to do the nut off the shaft spam, but I can't even get it to turn. My worry about using the engine to free up the cutlass bearing is that when I put the engine in gear, it's actually just gonna stall. There's gonna be so much resistance on that shaft. All right, I'm gonna put this block of timber in. That can sit there until I'm ready to do any more work on it so it doesn't slide forward. Got the clamps here as well. Straightened this one up pretty easy, just gave it a knock with the bit of timber actually, so that was pretty easy to straighten. Needs more straightening, but wasn't hard to do. While I was on the trawler, Andy swung past to grab the petrol water pump again, just so he could pump a bit more water out of the bilge. So I thought I'd head out there and get a bit of footage and talk a bit about what happened. And it turned out it was a seacock for the toilet that had been removed. So which is the hose now, Andy? How can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Right, so it was crushed, right? Yeah. And this was um, it's the very top one there. Here. Yep. Yeah. So that. Yep. That was bunged off. Yep. And it's come out. Yep. And it's got a. So is that a hose? A tap on it there? Uh, sorry, it's this one here. Ah, uh, this one. Yeah. So we need to make sure that yeah, doesn't. Yeah, I've got to bring a young thing. And so this seacock here is just seized, is it? Yep, fucked. All right. So yeah, we definitely need to make sure that doesn't. Just do the same thing. 
So at the end of the day, you can kind of see it's it's not so much the rain that sank it as the violent motion of rocking during the storm uh, knocked that hose down, made it whack against something, made the bung come out. Look, obviously it wasn't secured in hindsight as well as it needed to be. You know, these things happen and unfortunately you pay the price for them. You know, it's very easy in hindsight to think, all right, should have, uh, you know, gone the extra yard to secure that. But, you know, you're focused on the other work you're doing and you think it's going to be okay. Well, thanks for watching. Although it was a little bit sad with Andy's yacht, I think uh, there's obviously a lesson for everyone. You know, wherever you have some sort of skin fitting and you kind of tell yourself she'll be right, chances are it will be until you get some violent weather rocking the boat around, then obviously it isn't. Another way this kind of thing can happen is you get a big storm and something that's been sitting comfortably for a year can suddenly fall off a shelf or something, land on a sea cock and break it. You know, that's why you need strong, well-functioning sea cocks and keeping them closed when they don't need to be open. Look, you know, it's unfortunate. Andy's not a shipwright. These things happen. It's just a good lesson for everyone to sort of remember that things can go wrong and they will with boats if you're not, you know, really really careful so anyway there we are um next week we'll hopefully get on with the alignment again i've got to say i am struggling with it you're probably wondering why it's taking so long and i do i sit out there on my own and just think oh how am i going to make this happen so anyway try my best it's taking longer than i hoped i've got a bit of a plan but i am struggling with it i'll i'll be the first to admit that it's hard on your own sort of getting your head around it wrestling with this one ton motor and having this prop sharp problem I'm more and more feeling like I am going to have to take it up to a slip, get it out of the water and be able to wrestle the prop shaft from both ends to get this job done. But I want to try and get as much as I can done first so that I'm on the hard stand for as little time as possible and hopefully can drive back off it. There's, you know, I'm going to have to obviously tow the boat to the hard stand, but if I can get the exhaust rigged up, the cooling water rigged up, Maybe even start the engine in the boat, check it in the boat, disconnected from the prop shaft. It's not going to hurt to run it again, that's for sure. And then I know that when I get the alignment done, I will be able to drive the boat away from the, the slipway. So that's perhaps becoming plan A at this stage, but we'll see. All right, we'll take care and I'll catch you next week. See ya. on garden cam. I can see the uh, water monitors found the little pond I made for the first time. Sitting there with his tail in the water. Don't know why, it's not a very hot day. I presume they're cold blooded. But there he is. Dipping a toe in the pool, so to speak. Enjoy, buddy. There you go, Daisy, you have your own little pile. And no one can pick on you for being small. It's funny, Daffy's still still top chicken despite uh, having broken her leg, which is a sign of what a force of nature she is, but she looks after the others. Are you finally accepting that it's bedtime? Daffy always gets in last. She's kind of the alpha chicken thing, I think, maybe, you know, last to bed, first up, which means her place on the roost is uh, closest to the door as well. Because she's last in, first out. Go on, Daffy, time for bed. Checking everyone's there, are you? Having a look through the floor. Everyone's in bed, which means you can go to bed. Interesting that she checks first. It's a part of your job, isn't it, as alpha chicken? Oh. Good night. See you tomorrow.